Wasn't worship good this morning? Amen to that. My name is Brad Albin. I'm the senior pastor here at El Camino. If you're new with us, welcome to you. If you're watching online, welcome to you as well. Now, you're probably wondering that, yes, there is still heat in the building, which means there's still natural gas flowing here as well. And so, um, since it's such a big thing going on, I, I want to address it and bring you up to date as best as possible with what's taking place. So, a number of weeks ago, we did uh, have our annual um, assessment survey done, tests done, and there was some gas leaks found on the campus, natural gas leaks. Now, I am not saying that there is like a geyser of natural gas flowing out of the pipes. It is extremely, extremely small. They brought in their sophisticated sensors and stuff and found these things. However, like with a water leak, if you don't fix it over time, it will get worse. Now, I'm not saying it'll get worse in the next couple weeks. It'll be years down the line, all right? But it still needs to be fixed. Southwest Gas, they, they, they know about it. Um, there was about 20 Southwest Gas trucks out in our parking lot on Monday taking a look at things. And they drive really nice vehicles, I'm just saying, right? It's like, dang, I need to work for them. Um, they know all about it. There's preliminary work being done right now. Um, we still don't have a timeline for when the work will be completed. And the reason is because we're dealing with different agencies, uh, state agencies, uh, Southwest Gas, permitting, city, all that other stuff goes into it. And so just know that we are getting it done as fast as we possibly can. Now, like I said last week, there will be a point they will shut the gas off. We don't know when that is, all right? Um, but we will keep you informed. Um, keep bringing your coats on Sunday morning. We keep planning on having heat, but just in case we don't, uh, that would be a wise thing to do. So be praying for, for everything going on. We have a wonderful contractor that we're working with who's helping us out a bunch. Pray for him. Pray for the, the work of the Southwest Gas, and, and this would go smoothly, and we get this um, taken care of. So if any other information comes up, I will keep you in the loop, all right? There you go. All right, this morning, Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30 is where we're going to be camped out. Now, before we get into that passage, I thought it would be good to remind you all of where we started last week in this series. We started a series which I'm calling The Gifts. And it's, it's looking at what we might not consider to be gifts from God, but they most certainly are. The gift of time, the gift of talent. We looked at time last week. We'll look at talents or abilities this week, and then next week we'll look at the gift of treasure. And even though there's many differences between these three, they're also very much interconnected. And the reason they're interconnected is because they can be used for the kingdom of God, and not only that, but also to make an eternal difference in the lives of people. And like I said last week, we started with the gift of time, and hopefully you know that tomorrow is not guaranteed, right? In fact, making it home today from church is not guaranteed. That's not a scare tactic. That's just the truth of things. The Lord could call us home at any moment, and when he does, there's nothing we can do about it. The question that we looked at last week is, what are we going to do with the gift? What are we going to do with the gift of the time that we have left? And if you remember, we looked at the book of Ephesians chapter 5, and Paul said something very profound. He said, make use or make the best use of the time left. He used that word the. It's very informative that we understand what that, that means. Paul is reminding us not to make the most or make the best of all the time, right? I used the, the term carpe diem last week. It's Latin for seize the day. That's great advice, but that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying make the best use of the opportunities that God gives to us. Those opportunities that come our way to glorify his kingdom and also to reach people for his name. And we boiled it down last week that there are two ways in which we can do this, and they both deal with knowing the will of God, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. The first way we do that, make the best of the time, is we as believers need to regularly take a step back in our lives and examine how we are living. Examine how we are acting. Examine how we are behaving, how we treat people. Are we, are we putting on the characteristics of Christ when those opportunities come our way? Or are we acting more like our old selves? We boiled it down that it really is the, the process of sanctification. A movement from what we used to be like to being more like 
Christ. Now, we'll never be fully sanctified until God calls us home. That's the last step in the process. But we can always be looking at ourselves, evaluating ourselves. Am I looking more like Christ? Am I treating people more like Christ? Am I loving people more like Christ? That's God's will in the believer's life. But God's will is also this, and this is the second way we make the best of the time we have, is knowing that God's will is for none to perish. In other words, that all, not some, knowing that all would reach eternal life, that every single person would have a personal love relationship with Jesus. And how does God communicate that truth in the world today? He does it through you and me. He does it through his church. He does it in our everyday lives, which we'll look at more this morning. Making the best use of the opportunities that is is telling others about Christ. Now, I know I packed a lot in just a few minutes. So if you missed that, I encourage you to go back to last week, go to our website or go to our UP2 page and listen to that message. But for this morning, I want to look at the gifts of talents or abilities that we have. Now, just a heads up, this is going to be the physical gifts. This is not going to be the spiritual gifts that God gives us. That's another message for another day. Um, I think we will be doing that here in the near future. But for today, just the physical, natural gifts that we have. And so, Matthew chapter 25, starting verse 14, we'll read through verse 30. Let me pray first, though. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. And thank you for this time that we could gather into your house. God, I pray that as we get into your word, Lord, that you would speak to us. God, every, every time we need you, God, we need your wisdom to teach us, to train us, to develop us. God, we need your Holy Spirit to help us see who you are and how we can be more obedient to what your word says. God, speak mightily through what we're going to read. In Christ's name, amen. It says this. Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. This, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them and made five talents more. So also he who had two ta- the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid the master's treasure. Now, after a long time, the master of the house, or the master of those servants, came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, saying, came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, "Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more." His master said to him, "Well done, good and faithful servant." You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming... I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast uh, the worthless servant into the outer darkness in the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. What we see here. Like last week, is another parable of Jesus. And I first want to say this. This parable is really boiled down. It comes to down to stewardship. So you could apply it to time, the time we have, the, the, the abilities that we have. Like we're going to look at the authority that we have, um, the treasure that we have. We're going to, again, focus on abilities and talents. But if we were to just start in verse 14, it's kind of confusing. 
right? Jesus says this. He says, for it will be like a man going on a journey. What, what will be like a man? To find the answer, let's just go back up to verse 1. It says this. Jesus says, then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins. And he gives the parable of the ten virgins. So again, like last week, we saw this. We started our series with the very foundation that we have to have a certain mindset, an eternal mindset. You may remember we started last week in Matthew 13 where Jesus says this. He says, the kingdom of heaven, just like this morning, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field. And again, you may remember that parable is all about salvation. It's all about eternal life. And the man is not you or me. For we don't have anything that we can actually buy the field with. We can't buy our own salvation. The man in that parable is Jesus. And he's given everything he's had, he has, his body and his blood as a payment for our sin. And because of that, we get to partake in what the field has to offer. That ultimate gift, that ultimate treasure, eternal life. We need to have that mindset. So as we go back into Matthew 25, verse 14, we could literally read it like this. We could say, so the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. The first thing I want us to see is this, friends. Whose property is it? The master. It's, it's the master. It's God's. We'll get there, Molly. I promise you, okay? We'll relate this back here in a minute. Don't get ahead, all right? You want to come up here? No, I'm joking, Molly. Love you. It's the masters, right? The master is the one who has the property and gives it to his servants, right? So when we relate this back to abilities, here we go. God is the one who gives us our natural talents. God is the one who owns that. God is the one who bestows that upon us. Now, please keep that in the back of your mind. That's going to become so important when we come to the end. But let's continue. Verse 15 says this. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. It's important to understand what a talent is. A talent is a measurement of money. And it's measured out in weight. It's still debated as to how much a talent actually weighed. From my research, I got between 50 to about 120 pounds. So for this morning, I like to say it's about 75 pounds. Can we all agree on that? 75 pounds sounds good, right? Now, back then, a talent was either gold, either silver, or it was bronze, a precious metal. And people would use these to trade with or to buy something with. And so I got thinking, like, how much would one talent of gold, it's the most precious metal, how much would one talent of gold be worth today? And so I went and did some math. I went on my computer because I'm not going to actually do it, right? I wanted to look it up. Gold right now is trading for about $2,000 an ounce, all right? A little bit more than that, but $2,000 makes it a nice round number. There's 16 ounces in a pound of gold. So if you have a pound of gold right now, it's worth $32,000, okay? Now, if you have 75 pounds, did I do that math right? Thank you. I actually did do the math, okay? If you have one talent of gold, okay, which is, again, about 75 pounds of gold, you have what I like to call a lot of money. You would have $2.4 million. 2.4. If you have five talents, you would have $12 million. I hope I'm doing that math right. That's a lot of money. No matter what it is, that's a lot of money. Right? And notice who the master is entrusting all this money to. It's not his banker. If it were me and I had that money, I'd go right to Jim Moore and I'd say, Jim, you need to invest this right up. And he'd be like, absolutely, I'll take your money. I wouldn't give it to my servants, but that's exactly what this guy does, this, this master does. He trusts his servants, or a better word might be he trusts his slaves. One has five talents, one has two, one has one, each according to their ability. But see, friends, here's where it gets difficult. This is where pride 
likes to present its nasty face. Because what's one of the first things we think? I don't want to be the guy that gets two talents. I, I don't want to be the person that gets one, right? We, we focus on the amount. I want to be the guy that gets the five talents. I want to be most trusted. I want to have the most abilities. Friends, we cannot focus on the amount. I remembered when I first started ministry, I'd get this question all the time. Brad, where do you want to be in ministry in 5, 10, 20 years from now? And I would always go back for the first year or two, I'd always go back, I want to be in a mega church. Like I thought, if I could be the pastor of a mega church, 3,000 plus people, I would have arrived. That would have been success. That means I would have made it. And I can tell you this, friends, I can't do that. That's not where my skill set lies. And I had to listen to people say, Brad, you know what? That's just not you. And that's okay. But I was thinking, well, they're better than. That that pastor's, he's better than. And I remember one man, his name's Larry. He came to me and said, Brad, the pet senior pastor of a church of 3,000 could not be the pet senior pastor of a church of 100. It's not their abilities. That's not their skill set. It's not better or worse than it's what each person is skilled and has the ability to do. Friends, if I had to guess, this is where I believe the Lord wants El Camino. I would love to be right around 750 people. After that, we start planting churches all over southern Arizona. God, where do you want us to go? Much more than that, I don't think that's for me. And I'm okay with that. That's fine. I also would struggle being the pastor of a church of 100. That's just not the skills that God has given to me. But it's not about the amount. But even think about it like this, friends. One talent, $2.4 million. It's a lot. It's a lot. And the master trusts this servant with that. The talent that each man gets suits them best the, the, the master knows what the servant can and cannot do. If the, servant, if the master were to give the servant that got one, five, setting them up for failure. And vice versa. The, 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 the servant that should get five only got one, setting them up for failure. The master gave what they know they could handle. And it's only pride that leads us to desire and to envy other people's abilities. We shouldn't think that way. We should think, okay, God's given me the ability, the talent to do this, this, or this. How can I use them? Now, you might be saying, Brad, that's all well and good, We're talking about abilities and talents and such, but I really don't know what my natural abilities are. I've had that question numerous times. And here's my simple question back. What do you like to do? What do you have, what do you have a passion for? And it's not just in the church. Friends, we, we have people that come into the church all week long and get this place ready for Sunday. It's amazing. I've never seen the front look so good. Our, 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 our weeds and seeds team, whatever we're calling it, they're doing an amazing job. We have ladies come in on, on Sunday mornings, first Sunday, and those little cups, they don't come full. They got to every single one, right, 250 times. Nobody sees them. We got people coming and doing things that, that nobody, I don't even see. They're using their gifts, their talents. We have tech people. We have, we have people that run lights and do uh, uh, security and, and safety team, both talents big and small, seen and unseen. And they, they're used to make a difference here and around the church for the betterment of God's kingdom at El Camino. But it's not just Sunday morning. Sunday morning, we're here for what? Two, three, four hours maybe? How many more hours are there in the week? What do we have a passion for in life? What do you have a passion for? Maybe you love reading. You can get up in the morning. You could read. That'd be your thing. Right? Maybe, maybe you love filing things and organizing things, and your house is super meticulous. That's great. Don't come to my house. I've got two kids, right? Maybe you love working out or running or biking. Maybe you love food. You're a foodie. Or maybe you love wine. You're a wine connoisseur, right? Maybe you love dirt biking or camping or hunting Whatever it is, right, that's the things that you can use. Those are your natural abilities. Those are your natural talents. The, the question, again, is how are we going to use those skills to make an eternal difference? I think the answer comes in verse 15 again. Let's read this. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went 
away. Notice again something. Everybody got something, right? Five, two, one. But also notice for them, this, friends. The master does not tell the servants what to do. Not that we know of, and we're not going to add any more to the Bible. What does it say? He leaves. Here, I'm giving you this. I'm going away. Doesn't give instruction. Doesn't say, hey, uh, servant number one, I want you to do A, B, and C. Servant number two, do D, E, and F, and so on, right? Doesn't say that at all. The master knows. He knows what they're good at. He knows their abilities and what they're capable of. And he gives them the freedom to choose how to use those abilities and use those gifts that he's already given. In fact, I, I read this this week, and I read this multiple times, but this stuck out to me. The first, it says the first uh, servant, the one who got five, went out and he traded, made five more. The second one, it just says he made two more. We don't know how. Maybe he bought a business and grew the business over the course of time. We don't know. Right? But he did something. See, God being the same way, he knows who we are, he knows where our abilities, and he gives us the freedom to choose how we will use them in the everyday and the mundane. I'm going to give you two examples. And one of them, I'm going to brag on my wife a little bit, but she knows it's coming. Um, she's going to institute this thing wherever I bring her into her message, it's going to cost me five bucks. Um, this is going to be worth the five bucks. So a number of years ago, when we were up in Washington, she worked at a, at a coffee stand, a drive-thru coffee stand. And um, she, I would go in there, the best white chocolate mocha you've ever had in your life. That was just, you know, something that she did really, really well. She made coffee really, really well. And every once in a while, she would come home, and she would say, hey, Brad, do you remember so-and-so? And sometimes I'd say yes, and sometimes I'd say no. Many times there are people from the church that we used to go to that haven't gone there in a long time, people we went to high school with, whatever, whatever it was, Right? And if she, no matter what, I'd say, okay, well, what, what happened? She's like, well, I was talking to them. They came into the coffee stand. I was talking to them, and they're doing good, blah, blah, blah. And I invited them to church. That was it. But I was so proud of her. She, she took that opportunity to say, hey, why don't you come on back to church? It wasn't a gospel presentation right there. She's making the coffee. It was simply, hey, come on back to church. Take the opportunity. Her ability was in making coffee, and she used that. Simple. How about this one? This last Wednesday, I was at uh, prayer, um, and thank you to the crabs for being so faithful and leading that up. If you've never gone to the prayer time, or you haven't been in a while, I, I can't make it all the time, but when I can, I love going 6 o'clock and see building right over here. Um, but I was talking to, to Stephen, um, and he mentioned a missionary, and I will not mention his name, even though I probably can, um, but he has a walking ministry. He used to run like eight miles a day, but then he's gotten a little older, and so, but he loves walking. So he'll walk like eight miles a day. I don't walk eight miles in a week, right? But he walks eight miles a day. But the great thing is this. He doesn't walk alone. He's, he's made a ministry of it. He invites these, these people, his, his friends that aren't believers, and he takes them on walks. And whenever the opportunity presents itself, he brings in God. Brings an invite to church. It's not that they're walking. He's just like, hey, do you know Jesus? If not, you're going to hell. Okay, let's keep walking, right? That's not it. He's just using that natural thing he loves to do to present the gospel, to be, to be Christ in flesh when those opportunities arise. And they probably, they don't arise every day. Some days it's just, how's your family? Let's just talk through stuff. Hey, let's talk politics. That's always a fun one, right? But the using those moments and the abilities that God has given to make an eternal difference in the life of people. And what's absolutely great, friends, is this is the outcome is not upon us. The outcome is not up to us. We must simply be faithful and use those abilities that we have. Look what the master says to the first two. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. Verse 16 through 23, he who had received five talents went at once and traded with them and made five more talents. So he also, uh, so also he who had two made two more talents. But he who had received the one talent dug in the ground and hid the master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you, divide, you, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I've made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have 
been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And we cannot overlook that last line. Enter into the joy of your master. The joy, friends, was not found in their accomplishments. The joy wasn't found in, hey, look how much money I've done. Look how much money I've made. That's not where the joy came from. I'm sure there was some accomplishment I'm sure they were excited to have their master come back and say, hey, master, I've I've done this for you, but that was not their ultimate joy. The same thing with God, friends. The joy that we will have will not be found in our results. I can't control the results. You can't control the results. It's found in God's joy and in our faithfulness. And friends, when we understand that, that's so freeing takes the stress off. Takes the stress off. I I don't have to worry about, okay, I made an invite. Are they going to come? That's not up to me. I I, I made an invite. Are they going to attend? That's up to them. I I presented the gospel to them. I I told them my testimony. I'm done. I'm, I'm free. I get a rest in what God's going to do. God will handle the rest. We are supposed to just be faithful, simply use what God has given to us for his kingdom and for the eternal glory of people. He also gives a warning, though. We cannot miss this as well. Verses 24 through 30, he also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground, but here... Have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money in the, with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For more, or from me, for two, everyone who has will be more be given. And he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast into the worth of servant, into the outer darkness, in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's two things I want us to see here, friends. Number one is this. The servant knew who the master was. There won't be any excuse. There won't be any excuse. I didn't know what you wanted me to do. He knew who the master was. The servant just wasted the opportunity. Second thing I want us to see is this, is notice that the master judged each of the servants individually. He could have done it as a group, and it would have been a decent return. He gave out eight talents and got 15 more back. That wouldn't have been bad, but he doesn't do that. Same thing with God, friends. We will be judged by God individually. We will not have the excuse of, well, I didn't use my abilities because the church I go to didn't have the right programming. Not an excuse. The master didn't set up a program before he left. He said, here, I've given you abilities, go use them. We won't have the excuse of, well, I didn't use my abilities, my talents for your kingdom of God because my friends weren't doing the same. We won't have the excuse of, God, I I didn't have the time. None of us have the time. We need to make the time and make use of the moments like we looked at last week. In reality, the master wasn't harsh. He wasn't unfair. He was just. What does it say, you wicked and slothful servant? This, the servant was simply lazy. He didn't want to use what he had been given. Friends, I, I wish I could give you a formula. I wish I could stand up here and say, hey, do A, B, C, and D, but everybody's abilities and talents are different. I think the biggest thing is this, is having the courage to walk in them. Having the courage to use them. Simply let God do the rest. And here's the wonderful thing, friends. Remember back when I said, keep in the back of your mind that that, um, who is the giver 
It's God. Who, who, who's the talents and the abilities belong to? It's God. Should we not think that God wants us to use them? If he's given them to us? And not only that, should we not think that God wants us to be successful in using them? Should we not think that God is setting up times in our lives, those moments where we can use them for his kingdom? He's not setting us up for failure. He's setting us up for success. The fields are white with harvest. Go. Simply use what I've given to you. Take those moments on. God has given us such wonderful opportunities in the church, in our jobs, in our schools, in our neighborhoods. Some opportunities are big and some are small, but they're all important. And God is asking his church, what are you going to do? What are we going to do, friends? As we look at 2024, and here in a few weeks, we're going to have our, our family chat kind of laying out where I see us going. There's going to be plenty of opportunity to use your abilities and your gifts and your talents. Um, Mark Sherman and I and my wife went and looked at a ministry that we're going to partner with. I'm not going to give you any more information quite yet, but I'm excited. I'm excited because it's going to get us out and able to talk with people in real ways, able to minister to people in real ways and use those abilities. And you might be thinking, well, Brad, my, my abilities are kind of kind of insignificant. That's not true. It's not true. You may think so, but God can use small things in a big way. It doesn't matter if it's the one talent or the five. God is simply calling us to use those abilities that we have. So I'm going to pray that God continues to work in this place and in the city and that he will reveal those opportunities to us all. Amen? All right, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. God, help, it. help us understand what our, our talents and abilities are. And God, I, I would pray then more specifically to help us have the courage when those opportunities present themselves to not let them pass by. Give us the, the, the wisdom we need, the courage we need, the words we need, and God, just help us be faithful. Help us be faithful in taking those things that we do every single day and somehow reaching people for your name and your kingdom, for your glory. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.